Today's episode of the Meet and Greet Barbecue podcast is brought to you by AOS Outdoor Kitchens. They are the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Meet and Greet Barbecue podcast. Today we're speaking to Matthew Hoggard, otherwise known as Hoggy, from Hoggy's Grill, where we're going to talk to him about how he's gone from professional cricketer right the way through to barbecue school owner and everything in between as well. But Hoggy can talk more about that. So without much further ado, here's Hoggy. Welcome, Hoggy, to the Meet and Greet Barbecue podcast. It's fantastic to have you here. And um, for everyone, please introduce yourself. Let us know who you, who, who you are. Yeah, so I am Matthew Hoggard, a ex-cricketer, a now barbecue school um, proprietor, um, and a massive um, Mickey taker. <laughs> Perfect. In that that's order. Exa- yeah, that's where exactly <laughs> what we want to hear. Um, in in which case, you know, it's a big kind of leap from one of your professions to the other, where you find yourself now. So, talk us through that journey of how you went from cricket to barbecue school proprietor yeah so I was say, from off. cricketer to mickey taker <laughs> <laughs> I've always, that, uh, no that's always been with, with the, with the mickey taking throughout the throughout the um, life really um but from cricketer to um barbecue i went to south africa at 18 years old and mm-hmm. i played club cricket over there and they bry every night they've got the weather for it they've got fantastic meat and they've got cold beers and lovely wines, and to sit out in the open, almost guaranteed nice weather, um, with the smell of the real fire, with the the drinking, the eating, and just creating such lovely memories of standing out and <clears throat> and enjoying each other's company while while Brian or barbecuing in England, um, fell in love with it. I've been doing it for the last forty um, years. <laughs> um, so not too long and I was lucky enough to make a profession through cricket um, I was lucky enough to play for my country for nine years um, I played professional cricket for oh, 16 years and I retired in 2013 I tried my hand at coaching, commentary I tried my hand at insurance I tried my hand at foreign currency and I didn't love any of it and my wife got rather angry with me and said, right, you need to find something you're passionate about. And I said, eating and drinking. Mm-hmm. Eating and drinking was well, barbecue school. Nobody, I say nobody knows how to barbecue in the UK, but um, barbecuing in the UK, people tend to pre-cook the chicken in the oven before they plunk it on the, on the barbecue. They burn the sausages. They get horrible patties from the supermarket. I wanted to educate people. Stay, and you know what? time it shouldn't be stressful you can cook anything on a grill that you can cook in a kitchen and i wanted to share my love of the alfresco dining and real fire cooking with, with everybody else so hence we opened hoggy's grill <laughs> was hoggy's grill always kind of first in mind when you were going through that you know what am i going to do next after after those series of things was it just barbecue school or did you not think about uh, catering or chefing or was it just straight to teaching people no, not at all. So, again, it was like leaving school. So you retire from professional sport, it's like leaving school. Um, but 40 years or 30 years later, you haven't got any um, qualifications that are current or <laughs> that people want. You've got a, an ethos, you've got a drive, but you don't know what to do with yourself. And when you're 17 and you've left school, you, you can jump and up, up and down ladders and change career paths. I didn't know what to do with myself at all. Um, I was coming in hour in a, bar, a, a barbecue school. Um, we said, right, well, you, you want to do it. Let's do it. Uh, we didn't know where to do it. So we had a word with the local butchers who had the lambing sheds that we were going to convert into a barbecue school. Um, they wanted a little bit too much control. So chance meeting at a, a Christmas party um, with a garden centre. Say, right, you need to meet these guys. Um, they've got a garden centre. They they know you from your cricketing days and they're willing to to put a Hoggies Girls School at the garden centre. So we, we said, right, let's go for it. And we 
we had maybe a year of planning the barbecue school, and we opened up in 2020, just in time to shut the COVID. <laughs> no, <it's> just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that must have been a pretty stressful time. Uh, it was. And when we went to the garden centre, it was a nursery. They sold plants. They had a small cafe. Um, and we were at the back of the, the nursery. We were in a long polytunnel. And behind us were fields and then butler water. And it was a lovely spot. We had a fantastic view. Um, but it was just a nursery, just a plant selling nursery. And the garden centre invested a lot of money. And now I am in a hooker garden centre. It is really posh. They have a, a a restaurant called The View overlooking the, the water. Um, it is lush. It is one of the nicest garden centres in in the um, in Rutland, um, if not the best garden centre in Rutland. Uh, and it is now really posh, and I'm, I'm stuck on the end. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, but, but we open. We opened up in in then in a um in a building site. So we opened up just in time for COVID. Then we had restrictions. Then we had the cost of living crisis. Then we had the building site. People had to go into the Hoggies Grill with a um, a hard hat on to get through the building site to get into Hoggies Grill before they're allowed to take it off. Um, it was so the last three four years have been bedlam because everything's contrived to against us and saying right then you're not doing this. Um, but we're still here. We're still, we don't owe any money. We're still going. Um, we're really lucky that it's a family business. So my wife does all the admin and the hard things, um, like the organization and everything else. I rock up and cook and entertain the guests. And our son helps with entertaining the guests and washing. So it's a real family affair. We've been really lucky that our, our, um, our garden center, our, um, People that let us there uh, looked after us during COVID. So if yeah. people weren't in, we didn't have to pay. It wasn't a fixed rent. We only paid for the people that came in. And we decided that we we were going to open a shop, but then we didn't have the capital to put in all the <laughs> all the stock. So we then said, right, we'll open the school until we get the capital to open. The, and we were going to drop ship, but drop ship, we had COVID and all the big people said, right, we don't want any more stock. If it's not on the water, we're not taking any more stock. So then we had the backlog of you can't get grills in the UK because everybody bought a grill yeah. at the start yeah. of COVID. Um, then you saw you couldn't drop ship. So our business model has split and flipped very, very, very regularly. Um, but luckily, we've only got Sarah and I in the in the company. And she tells me what we are doing. Um, so it's nice and easy. We don't have to go to committees. We don't have to take too long in making decisions. We said we weren't going to do outside catering. And now outside catering are <laughs> things that we do. And we go out and cater. Uh, I love outside catering. Um, so it, from what we thought it was going to be to what it actually is now is completely different. But it's a roller coaster. And I've loved every minute of it. I suppose that's part of an agile business nowadays, isn't it? As well, being able to kind of pivot to to do different things, but <laughs> <laughs> but it it just sounds like uh, and for people watching this on perhaps YouTube rather than listening, but you can definitely see just when you're talking about it the passion that mm -hmm. that comes through, even though all of the things that you've had to do during the last few years of like you said, COVID, cost of living, all the, all those things. <laughs> You're still smiling when happy. you're talk, yeah. talking to us about it. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we had a, an amazing day yesterday with Andrew Peace Wines and we had influences in. And just we do kids eat free burger classes and pizza classes. And it's just the enjoyment of people that come to the grill that don't normally cook. They don't cook inside um, in the kitchen and they come and you get them prepping food. You get them cooking food and you get them eating it. And when they taste it and go, wow, this is amazing, and they say, thank you so much, well, I've done nothing. All I've done is shout at you. I mean, I am just told you, guys, from scratch, cook everything from scratch, and to hear people say, Do you know what, this is the best food that, the, not not just that the, the, they've cooked, but they've eaten, uh, it, it brings a smile to my face. And it's that 
that whole ethos of knowing where your food's coming from, what's in your food, and you cooking your food, and the enjoyment. You, we've had people come to the grill system um, that are strangers and have organized holidays together before they've left. I'm thinking, well, that is the power uh, of food yeah. in general, but sitting out, sitting around food, preparing food, cooking over a real fire, there's something Neanderthalic about it. There's something really nice about just cooking good food on fires and people come together and have a fantastic time. It must have been so fun to plan out the cooking space of the school. Where you even start? Oh, you think we planned, do you? (laughs) (laughs) But 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 thinking about you've you've got us all wrong. (laughs) Thinking about what I want people cooking on, what I want to be teaching on, how many of them do I want? What's the setup going to look like? All of that must have been something. I mean, I know I would love doing that. (laughs) Yeah. So, So again, everything was organic. Um, because we, we, we did it on a shoestring. Um, we, we had to speak nicely to, to some barbecue companies and say, do you know what, we, we want to use your equipment, but what, what can we have? Um, <laughs> and it's gone from maybe two or three grills and two, we've got a myriad of different grills now. Um, I'm a big fan of KJ. Um, we use a lot of Mado Joe and Masterbuilt. We've got Traegers, we've got Somerset grills, we've got offset smokers, we've got PKs, we've got fire pits. Um, you name it, we, we seem to have it. Um, but we always seem to go, people always seem to come back to the sort of like ceramic way of mm-hmm. cooking and the KJs and the versatility of KJs. And I mean, we had, the, the day yesterday we were cooking Yorkshire puddings and people say you can't cook Yorkshire puddings on a, on a grill. And I said, well, I'm from Yorkshire. Where there's will, there's a way. He can he can take your he can take the man out of Yorkshire, but not Yorkshire out of the man. So we were making Yorkshire puddings and sirloin steaks with a bit of chimichurri sauce with some canapes and uh, just to open people's eyes and people going, "Wow, Yorkshire puddings on a grill! You can bake cakes on a grill! You can do anything on a grill!" And do you, do you find that a lot a lot of people that are coming to the school? Uh, are complete novices when it comes to barbecue or do you get quite a good range of people that perhaps have a grill and they've delved into it a little bit more or to some people that like me that have got about 10 and just immerse <laughs> themselves into it all the time yeah. so i go well, everything every spectrum you get people that don't even know how to cut up an onion um to people that have 10 grills um with the 10 grills it's lovely to just to bounce ideas off people and to say have you tried this have you done that um I did this the other day, and that that, that worked really well. Um, have you dropped a little little bit of hickory on it? So it, there's so many different things that you you learn off each other, and I think that is the fantastic thing about the barbecue community. Everybody's really friendly. Everybody is so free with the information. Everybody just wants to eat great food and pass the joy on of smoking, open fire cooking, and grilling out El Fresco. So you mentioned obviously about the kids, kids uh, eat free classes that you'd done around burgers and pizzas. I think you've kind of been doing that across the summer, haven't you? Um, yes, some holidays. So, yeah, and uh, that in itself must be quite rewarding. Just kind of trying to get the next generation into a being able to cook and you know be more independent, but actually understanding how cooking over fire works and and actually it's not a scary thing at all. Yeah. Just, just be in charge of your own destiny. Because I say, right, it doesn't matter what your mum and dad like. This is about what you're eating. You're cooking it. You're making it. You're eating it. So don't come in with any free ideas. We've had kids put maple syrup on their burgers and in their burgers. <laughs> Not for me, but the kids love it. They've always had people sugaring, sugaring their burgers, but eating it. Um I'm not a fan, um, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have said, you know what, let, let, let's try maple syrup on, on this burger. But the kids, if the kids are smiling, if the kids are loving it, if the kids say, I cannot wait to make burgers again, then that's half the, the job done. People, to get kids interactive in what they want to eat, how they're eating it, what flavours are actually going into their food, giving them the opportunity to cook for themselves. We've had little eight-year-olds that cook for the family. And say I made a spag bowl last night. It it melts my heart that you get the next generation actually wanting to to cook for other people, and I don't know why. And it, I think it stems about from seeing 
seeing my son feed for the first time. And I saw him feed for the first time, and I was in bits. Um, I, I love being a feeder. I love giving people food and seeing the smiles on their faces. And nine times out of ten, I'm, I'm done with it. Done with the eating. I, I, I don't eat. I just love people enjoying their own food and having the opportunity to make decent food or on a grill. In fact, I don't even care if it's on a grill. I just like people enjoying decent food and cooking their own food and knowing where that food's come from. Mm. On that point, the meat that you use in the school, where do you source that from? And is that similar to what you're cooking with at home when you're cooking for yourself as well? Yeah, so we use um, Gary Simpson, our Simpsons Butchers. Um, He's award-winning. He's twice won Britain's Best Butcher Shop. Um, he's local, he's in Stamford, which is 10, 15 minutes away from the grill school. So I can WhatsApp him the day before when I've forgotten everything. I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've forgotten X, Y, Z. Or, you know, I, sometimes I'm organised to do it for the day. But he's so versatile, he's got so many different products and ranges. And the the meat that we get, he knows exactly where it's from. You know exactly where it's been eaten. You know where it was slaughtered. You know how long he's had it. It comes comes to us in the fridge, and it's always fresh because it's so local. Um, and half the if you use great products to start with, that's half the battle. It, it's harder to to mess up um, great products. Um, uh, but it, equally, I've had. I, I have had the odd, whoosh, I've forgotten everything. I need to go to Aldi on the way in. Mm-hmm. And I've cooked things from Aldi. And the clients have said, you know what, this is the best best things we, we've eaten. I said, well, I've got a confession. <laughs> They're from <laughs> Aldi. Um, and for our fish and our seafood and our scallops and our prawns, we use a fish rich company from Nottingham, which again is a is nice and close. I know we're nowhere near the sea. Um, in fact, uh, Leicester's got, <laughs> is the middle of the country that's furthest away from the sea. Um, but to have people going to to Grimsby Docks in the morning and bringing you fresh fish, um, there's so many times we halfway through the morning and we're having lemon sole or we we're having place for, for lunch and it's not there yet and they come in and they bring it in from the van fresh from the van say yeah fresh this just bring some Grimsby Docks in here and you can't get fresh from that so yeah it's really nice we've got some really good um, suppliers. They've looked after them really well, and I love having local relationships. I think that's definitely key, isn't it? Um, do you find the, the the social element? You mentioned obviously back in South, you know, when you were living in South Africa and you're having the bries, the social element, beer or not, um, you know, just kind of getting together around. That. Is, is, is there not a food. law about grilling? Uh, it's almost <laughs> illegal to grill without a beer or a drop of wine in your hand. <laughs> uh, y- yes, I think it's unwritten, but pretty much. <laughs> it is a way. Uh, no, no, I was so just so going to say. About the social it, uh, yeah, it, and do you try and bring as. M- How does that kind of work with perhaps a group of strangers that are coming together? How do you kind of get them to, like you said, book holidays by the end of it? What does it, you know, part of that <laughs> yeah. experience so, really? Yeah. So I am. Um, I hate rules. I hate regulations. I hate being told what to do. Um, I like fun. I like interaction. I like being in charge of, of what I'm doing. So although there are guidelines and saying right, then this is what we're eating, like, like a salsa. Right. I'm not going to tell you how to make a salsa. If you want a spicy salsa, we've got some chilies. I suggest you put two chilies in. If you don't like chilies, don't put chilies in. Um, if you like coriander, let's zest it up with a coriander. Some like. If you don't like coriander, you think it takes a soap, we've got some parsley, we've got some chives. Don't put coriander. And to, to have people, this is about your taste buds, not my taste buds. This isn't about me dictating to you how you should prep a meal, how... Uh, what you're putting in your in your food we'll give you the main main ingredients and then i'll tell you you if you like it your steak medium rare uh, it's three minutes if you like it or if you like it rare it's three minutes you like medium rare it's four if you like it over that you can leave 
Um, there's all I try and make it fun. <laughs> I try and like the no, the, it's not a a stuffy atmosphere. It, it is about enjoyment. It is, and food does that to people. And I don't. If I went to a course, I would hate to watch somebody else cook because I went. I, I'd go to a course and I'd want to be hands on. I'd want to be doing the cooking. I wouldn't want to watch them cook and then go home and try and replicate that. So everything yeah. uh, is we. I'll make the start. So I make little nibbles to start with. So they'll they'll come in at ten o'clock. They'll have a nibble that we've already we've already made. Then everything else I don't prep. I don't touch. I do absolutely bugger all. It's except for make their experience hopefully fun, enjoyable, and they do all the prep, all the cooking, and all the eating. Well, maybe I nick some food afterwards, but um, <laughs> depends on what they've cooked. Um, That's your right. But it is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it is a hands-on. You, the, the guests do all the work. They do all the prep. They do all the cooking. They do all the eating. We just supply the the soft drinks, the teas, the coffees, the the alcohol, and just try and get everybody to have it a fantastic time and an enjoyable experience. You're right. Uh, the hands-on technique from learning and cooking yourself, you pick up so much more from that. Because if you're just watching someone for half an hour, an hour, you're not getting the feel, the touch, the way that meat bends and when you're cooking yep. and things. You know, all of that you're not you're not getting through. Um, when you develop, well, I know no planning, as I said, but as you're learning and teaching <laughs> as it's going on, is your technique and how you're teaching people changing over time? Yeah. Obviously, um, if you don't, if you, if you don't progress, if you don't improve, you're standing still. And um, when you go back to sport and everything else, it, it, and coaching, the everything progresses through things. You're always learning, you're always picking up little things, you're always developing your skills, and you don't want to be stagnant. So um, you you're trying little things every time. You're changing the menu, um, and it's. You'll you'll pick up little things from on different customers said, you know, I could have done that better. And uh, next week you, you implement that. Um and I've got an, a seventeen year old son who does a lot of the classes, who's not backwards in coming forwards. And he will tell me, Do you know what, this is what we should be doing, we should be doing and it's a suggestive hint. And um, you listen to your clients, you listen to how how they've enjoyed it and you wanna improve every time. I'm I'm not I'm not an arrogant little bar humbug that says, right, we're, this is the only thing that we're doing, this is how we're doing it, and this is always going to be how we do things. Um, so we try and we try and bend and be really flexible. So you know you were sort of saying about kind of being flexible to what they want in terms of, like you said, if you don't want chilies, don't have chilies. If you want, yeah. you know, yeah. coriander, etc. Yeah. Is that the kind of the same in terms of equipment? So if someone wants to use the Traeger, they use the Traeger. If they want to use a KJ or a pizza oven, or even if they're not cooking pizza, do, do you kind of allow that flexibility as well? Correct. Um, because the whole the whole element of Hoggy's Grill is, you know, come in and experience different things. If you haven't, if you've got a card or if you've got a clay oven, you, you can, by all means, if you want to experiment and use different other I will suggest that, you know what, the Traegers are fantastic for smoking, slow cooking, not fantastic for searing. Um, Master Bolts, exactly the same. I will explain to them how each grill works and what the benefits are of each grill. Um, we'll explain the menu to them. I say, right, then, what, what we're cooking? And I'll give them give them the option. Sometimes people will email in before and say, right, then I have a KJ, so can I do all my cooking on a KJ? You get other people that come in saying, I'll cook on gas and I want to really cook on gas. And then you explain how easy everything else works. And they go, yeah. maybe I want to use real fire today. <laughs> <laughs> so we do, not swearing, but we do have gas. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we have gas bottles, but they're not normally full. <laughs> so, <laughs> people go and uh, if people are adamant they they want to come and use gas, then we'll go to the gas shop and we'll get some gas. But the whole ethos of Foggy's Grill is cooking on real life fire in smoke um, and elevating, uh, opening people's how how easy it is. So just um, to get a KJ from zero to two hundred degrees, you know, like seventeen minutes, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you say, nah, nah. 
it's not 17. In 17 minutes, you can get a KJ from no charcoal to 200 degrees, ready for your Yorkshire's for your Hasselback to to hold it and 20 minutes. And they say, don't you have to light it three hours in advance? And you go, no, you don't have to light charcoal three hours in advance. And in fact, if you only use a chimney starter, if you're using decent quality mm-hmm. lump wood charcoal, you can be cooking quicker than on a gas gab- barbecue because when you turn on the gas, you have to wait for all the the metal to heat up. So when the fat drips down, it turns into gas and goes back into your, into your food or, or, or to stop you having the, the fat fires. With charcoal, your fat drops down, it turns into nice flavours and come back up. And you don't have to light it three hours in advance. You can be 20 minutes before you're cooking and on charcoal. So it's just opening people's eyes of how easy charcoal is to use if you have the the right techniques and the, and the right equipment. Yeah, chimney starters. For anyone listening who has never listened to this podcast before and was maybe hoping to hear more about 2005, um, I would say from an ease perspective, a chimney starter and a meat thermometer are the two essential accessories for any barbecuing. But they're a great starting point as well if you're a bit intimidated because it just takes all of the pain out of barbecuing. Ah, uh, what, what what's pain in barbecuing? <laughs> no, 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 stop saying that. No, there's no pain in barbecuing. It, it's it's lovely. I, um, but yeah, meat thermometers are a must. It turns everybody into an instant better cook, and that implies in your your cooker as well, because you you'll get a I won't use any you'll get a, a chicken from a supermarket. It'll tell you that you need to cook it for two hours um, at two hundred and twenty degrees and blah blah blah. If you meet, use a meat probe, you'll find out that you know it's cooked after an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need the two hours. And they're they're giving you two hours to make sure that their their backsides are covered, and so everything's overcooked. Um, but as soon as you start using temperature probes and cooking to temperature, not to time, you find you meat is so tasty and juicy, not overcooked, and it takes all the guesswork out. You don't have to chop it in half and see how it's doing to let all the juices run out. You know exactly exactly when things are cooked and you can wow your guests while enjoying enjoying life and relaxing mm-hmm. but i think the biggest mistake that people make when they when they have barbecues you if you went round to a friend's house and you were saying right we're having a dinner party and you're sat inside in the dining room you have one starter you have one main course and you have one dessert all cooked in the kitchen there the person that cooks, always cooks, knows how to cook, has done the menu. You then say, oh, do you know what? It's a nice day. Let's have a barbecue. So you buy three different stars. You buy three different uh, um, main courses and you buy two desserts. You buy three starters that are cooked in different ways and at different temperature and different techniques. The three main courses are cooked at different times and different temperature and different techniques you give it to the person that doesn't cook normally and only cooks twice a year when the sun's out and and they go out and light their grill they don't have a freaking clue how to cook and they wonder why it's stressful Mm -hmm. now so keep it simple keep it nice and easy keep people wanting more and it is to me a so easy to say why do we complicate things when it comes to grill and people don't use the direct and indirect. I know you'll have talked about it all the time, the direct and indirect. They won't use the lids. Mm-hmm. They won't. They, 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 they don't use the right techniques and wonder why things are stressful and why they start wasting beer by chucking beers and wines over the flames that they're getting out because the fatty food's dripping onto the charcoal. They're bile, easy light charcoal that's pumped full of petroleum and then sprayed with fire retard and right. wondered why they smell <laughs> chemicals. It, 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 and that's why we opened up a school to to say, do you know what, it, it, it's so it, so easy and so it should be so easy and relaxing using using them um, chat. Mm. That's yeah. F- funny enough, I was uh, I was kind of going to bring up the kind of petroleum based fire lighters <laughs> and and charcoal and just how bad they are. It, you know, you know, when you go around people's houses and you know you get the little white blocks that you just. It's so oh, no, no, no. Yeah, and the easy light charcoal that's pumped full of petroleum products mm, and yes. fire retardant, so it doesn't 
that's like, and then it says wait for 20 minutes because you can smell when you, once you've lit it you can smell the chemicals coming off it and yeah. um, i mean it's, it's, and i've and i've got a a big job which which is big it is a huge barbecue it takes a lot of charcoal and when you put your charcoal in and I'm, I'm a big fan of low baltic um birch single species birch charcoal whack it in one fire lighter that you put into like a woody um, that mm-hmm. you use in your wood burner stoves, one fire lighter in the middle to start the fire. 20, 17 minutes later, it's at 200 degrees. Yeah. And people, that, you, you, but you didn't use any fire lighters. You didn't use, or well, you used one fire lighter. You didn't use any squirty crap. You didn't use anything else. It's one fire lighter, charcoal around it. You set it up, it gets to 200 degrees in 17 minutes. And people go, wow. And that's a huge, KJ, the smaller KJ will take a little lot um, less time. So it's opening people's eyes to how easy grilling can be if you buy the right charcoal. And that's one of the, my biggest bugbears is your charcoal. A barbecue is a sealed container. It holds charcoal. Therefore, the charcoal is the most important thing that you buy. It could be made out of steel, concrete, ceramic, you, you, iron. You know, it's just an enclosed chamber to hold your charcoal. Therefore, your charcoal gives you your heat, gives you the food, um, gives you the flavors, and it is the thing that makes your cooking experience good or bad. So, if the biggest thing that you take away from this podcast is invest in some decent lumpwood charcoal. If you've been looking or thinking about an outdoor kitchen, then look no further than AOS Outdoor Kitchens. They are the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists. Their extensive showroom is based just outside Bournemouth on the Dorset Hampshire border and as well as numerous in-store displays, also features a live outdoor kitchen where they cook every week on Kamado grills, pizza ovens and all filmed and shown on YouTube. They offer a wealth of knowledge on how to transform your patio into the most incredible outdoor dining area with styles and options to suit every budget and you can guarantee they will be able to create something perfectly suited to you and your home. They stock and supply everything that you're going to need for outdoor cooking, including barbecues, Kamado ovens, pizza ovens, outdoor fridges and every accessory that you would need to become the ultimate outdoor chef. So if you want to make yourself the envy of your friends and neighbours, get in touch with them today to arrange a consultation and take the first step in transforming your back garden into the most incredible entertainment space. Visit aoskitchens.co.uk yeah, we we we've uh, had a couple of episodes before where we've, we've actually dedicated them to charcoal and just about how you know <laughs> proper good charcoal is made and you know just yeah. because you're right, it's so essential. Um, but typically, it's like you said, twice a year when we've had the sun out, uh, you nip to your local supermarket, get the two ninety nine bag that's at the front of the store, and uh, <laughs> and end yeah. up using that. And I I also find that still even going to barbecues now. Even though I think we have come along along in in our barbecue journey, generally in the UK, everyone chucks everything on at once. It's mm-hmm. all cooked once. Oh. Whereas yep. it's, you've got to, it's got to be like get it out over three or four hours and just do little bits and pieces. Patience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Patience is the key. Yeah. And do you know what patience gives you? More time to drink. <laughs> exactly so, that. So when somebody asks you, how long would you cook this piece of meat? Ten beers. I say how long how how long you got? <laughs> because how long you've got is how long it will take me to cook that piece of meat. Because yeah. you have so much more time to get flavours into that piece of meat. You're not rushing it, you're not making it close that yeah. You're, you're, you're patience to me is the the buzzword. You don't have to be ready in ten minutes. And if you want a if you if you're cooking a big piece of meat, if you're cooking a brisket, if you do you know, get it. You you, want, you need to rest. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if you're inviting guests round at two o'clock, ready for two o'clock. Because even if you plan to get your meat ready for two o'clock, you'll hit that stall point. It won't get. It won't be cooked at two o'clock. You'll go past it. You'll people will be stressing because they came around to eat at two o'clock. If it's not ready, 
you're turning the heat up, you're now rushing it, you ruin the cook. You then say, oh, all right, it's ready now. You take it straight out. You start slicing it. All the juices run out. And you think, well, it's a bit tough. It's a bit dry. And you, you, you ruin the experience. Where I say, well, I'm getting people around at 2 o'clock. Well, let's get it ready for at least 12 o'clock, if not before, mm. and let it rest. Let it rest. Let it soak up the juices again. So when you're carving it, you've got no stress because your food's already ready. You are now just cooking the secondary bits. Your main superstar um, ingredient is already cooked. It's resting. Uh, if it's a brisket or your pulled pork, it's now in the cool box. It's, it, you, you, you did it four hours before. It's now just just ticking over. And you've got no, no rest whatsoever because you know that the superstar of your ingredient is ready. And all you have to do is take it out and carve it. To try and get it ready at the time that your guests arrive is absolutely not on. No, it's ridiculous. And also, that, you that, miss that out. Was quiet, that wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you miss out on the joy of half cut cooking. I like to call it at like <laughs> half eleven at night, midnight. Yeah, like, right, yeah. light the barbecue yeah. now. Get get everything yeah. on. Correct. And it's so fun. It's so fun to do that. Yeah. You know. And you can impart so much more flavors. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I had a guy come around um, the other day and he said, right, we're doing pulled pork. Um, I'm going to get up early uh, and put my pulled pork on. And I said, why? He said, well, I need to get up at half six just to get my pulled pork on so it's ready. I said, yeah, but why? You're using a trader. Put it on overnight, man. Mm. Get it on at 90 degrees overnight. It's not going to overcook because you're at 90 degrees. You your pork wants to get to 95 degrees before we're going to pull it and then there. So you can put it on in the morning, uh, before you go to bed. You can check it on your phone. You can make sure that everything's tickety-boo. And he texts me and says, you know, I had an 18-hour cook at 19 degrees. And it was absolutely banging. And it took all the, the stress out of getting up early, because nobody likes getting up early, um, of relaxing, having a lovely cook, getting as many flavours as you can, spritzing ah, it's just patience. The mm. longer you have to cook, the longer you take. So I think it's quite appropriate, Hoggy, that uh, whilst we've, you've been imparting all of those tips, that we kind of flip it on its head now and talk about some of the barbecue fails. That's one of the things that we hold very dear on the podcast. How long, how long we got? Uh, <laughs> As long as you've got patience, we want to hear the stories. <laughs> yeah, of course, so patience is the key. Um, and the the fails. Where, where do we go first? You failed at everything. As soon, when you start your barbecuing journey, you fail a lot of the time. You don't set fire to, you know, with smoke, with not letting enough air in, not getting the fire starting, so everything's so active and the horrible and the smoky and you, you take a bite and you're like, I can't eat that. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing. It just tastes like so You overcook things and you say, right, I've done burnt belly pork ends. Yeah, excellent. They are burnt. They're like <laughs> freaking duck. <laughs> they're, they're not succulent. They're not juicy. You've cooked them far too long. They're just crunchy in my mouth and horrible. Um, the list goes on and on. You, you, you take chicken off with before te- before temperature was a, a big thing. You say, right, ah, we've cooked it right. You, you open it up and it's raw. Uh, you, on your barbecuing journey, you will have failed so many times. Um, but if you're not failing, you're not progressing. If you don't, uh, but you, and then you learn. You, you get taught um, in a sporting environment that you need a safe environment to progress. That, you know what, if you're not failing, you're not progressing, you're just sat in a comfort. So it's same with same with anything in life. If you're just sat in one zone and doing things that are comfortable that you can do in your sleep day in, day out, then you're not going you're never gonna get better. And daring to I mean, I've failed with briskets. I've had briskets that you, you try and cook and you you cut and you're going, eh, I might need a saw. Um because <laughs> they're, they're super tough. Uh, and, and now, am I am I allowed to to swear? Yeah, on go on. Podcast? Yeah, go on. Um, I'm going to tell you that I think brisket's overrated. 
Wow. I I agree. I think it's a fun thing to cook, but if you're just talking about beef for a starting point, I've said many a times on here, I think beef ribs are the better option, personally. Oh, sure, beef ribs are. But uh, it's, um, brisket's a cheap cut of meat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you have to cook it a long time because, you know, it is a cheap cut of meat. Um, and I don't like long-cooked, slow-cooked beef. I I don't like stew. I don't like long cooked, slow cooked beef. Um, I'm much more of a fan of a pork or a lamb that's been long cooked, slow cooked. Um, but the the fantastic thing is horses, of course, is that uh, everybody has an opinion. And some other people say, "Jar, oh, not beef. The brisket is the best thing that's since sliced bread." Um, so I I'm not going to tell you not to cook it. I'm just saying that I I find that. I've I've tried brisket and I've put brisket where it, it it's bendy, you push it, it comes out all juicy and everything. And to me, it tastes like a cheap cut. I've wasted. <laughs> I say I've wasted. I've cooked it for for twenty hours, twenty four hours. I've cooked it so it's perfect, and I still haven't enjoyed the eating experience. I've mm-hmm. sliced it and gone, you know what? You know what? I'd ra- I'd rather have a tomahawk, a reverse tomahawk, with this piece of brisket. I'd rather have. Uh, every by state, I'd rather have a, a different cut of meat to to brisket, um, but it is horses for courses, and that's why cooking is is fantastic. Nobody nobody has the same taste buds. Nobody can tell you what you like and what you don't like, and that's what we we try and practice. On that point, then uh, we've talked a lot about different kind of cuts and everything. What is your favourite thing to barbecue? If no one else was around you, you weren't doing it for anyone else, just for yourself. <laughs> What would you cook? Uh, what what day of the week is it? <laughs> <laughs> a drinking my, my day. Whole e- <laughs> my, my, my whole ethos is that everything tastes better on a barbecue. Mm-hmm. So yeah. from a cooked breakfast, bacon, sausages, eggs, everything else tastes better on the grill. Mm-hmm. Um, your pork, your steak, your ribs, your chicken, everything tastes better on a grill. And your chili, your flank steak chili that you've dropped tastes better on a grill. Um, and it, and even left, I think leftovers, you can eat, I think leftover barbecue food, you can taste so much more smoke and so much more flavors that have mm-hmm. intensified in the fridge overnight that I'm going to say leftovers are absolutely one of my favorite things, things to eat. But I've avoided your question there, haven't I? What am I cooking? That was a, like a politician's answer. Yeah, <laughs> but everything is, is my answer. Um, it, it would most probably be a, a, a nice reverse seared tomahawk steak. Mm-hmm. I do love a, a bit, or oh, a bit of lamb. I love a uh, uh, pork, oh, but, but, but fish. I mean, prawns, lobster. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stop it. Um, everything. Perhaps we should. Perhaps we should. <laughs> Perhaps yeah, we should turn it around um, and say, uh, "What don't? What apart from brisket? What wouldn't you cook on the barbecue? Or what just don't you enjoy cooking?" Let's try and narrow um, that down. N- nothing. Oh, okay. I love a challenge. I love the challenge. So I bake cakes on the grill. I'm, I've already told you I make lunch puddings on the grill. There is nothing we've had. We've had um, chefs that have come in for development. Chefs that have made souffles in a grill. There is nothing you can't cook on a grill that you can in a kitchen. You just need to have the, the right technique and the confidence. And one of the biggest things I try and give our client is the confidence. The confidence to go out and try things. Because as you say, if you sit in your little comfort zone and you keep on cooking your sausages and your burgers, you're not going to get any better. So go out and say, Do you know what, let's practice, let's have the confidence to to put our decent cuts of meat uh, potatoes uh, everything else on the grill you'll sometimes you'll fail everybody's fails with 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 grilling everybody's failed in a kitchen so the reward that you get for succeeding outside with charcoal with smoke with wood is that the flavors that you impart are so much better than putting it in an electric oven in your in your kitchen or cooking it in a frying pan. So confidence, have a go and experiment and enjoy your failures. But other than that, you're going to enjoy your success so much more. 
I think this is a really uh, opportune moment to go into barbecue bingo, talking about ingredients and <laughs> challenging yourself. And um, So what I want to do is I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see. Uh, we've got a, a spinning wheel. We we paid a lot of money for this, Hoggy. Uh, so uh, It looks like you have the graphics are amazing. I know. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell my daughter she was on it for weeks. <laughs> um, uh, I might we, need to go to Specsavers because I can't read that. It's all right. right. It's, I, I, it's, Dan, Dan, Dan will talk. Out. Yeah, Dan yeah. will talk. Do, 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 do you know what? I'll, I'll trust you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other reason I read it out is because the people who are listening um, rather than watching it. So we've got this a large wheel in front of us with lots of different ingredients on that have been left. Now, now what are the guests. different colours? The different colours are the fact that it labels it different colours, so apparently it's easier to read when they're next to each other. Nothing to ah, do so with the type no, of food. So, so it's not earthy and fire or anything no, else. No, oh, we're not that sophisticated. Oh, you, you, you're not that sophisticated, okay. I'm nah. pretty sure if you check, you, you can't spell you know well what? That, that's, that's about <laughs> as slow as my bowling now. It's <laughs> <laughs> going, going any faster. It's only at the it's 95 like miles an hour. It's like water wheel. It's like slow torture. So, um, stop it. <laughs> Some of the bits that we've got on there, we've got tripe, kangaroo, beef neck, yeah. and do your sausage, vindaloo paste, octopus, sausage. nice, uh, yeah, octopus, nice. pineapple, monkfish, octopus, lovely, yeah, yeah. Chicken yeah. Oh, hearts, duck, yeah. Szechuan yeah. pepper, uh, paella, um, and something on there which we haven't discussed yet, which is called my signature dish. So if it lands on that. It's up to you what you cook. What are you best known for? That, that that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm best known for, for for nothing because I cook everything. Did you cook <laughs> everything then for us? Yeah. What? Well, it could take one of everything. Let's uh, let's deal with that bridge if it lands on it, shall we? Right. Yeah, let's let, give let, it a spin. Let's do that. Yeah. Oh, so you have here to we go. It. Yeah. No, we'll oh, the it. anticipation. You can see I'm yeah. nervous. Here comes the fast bowl. Yeah, go on then. It's going backwards and forwards. Oh, it's red. It's danger. Oh, it's undia yeah, sausage. Nah, that's boring. Can we have another spin? <laughs> have another spin if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. I'll give it another spin. Why not? Yeah, got got um, sausage. We 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 can cook sausage. Uh, and it. Like here. So- oh, spicy sausage pasta. That sounds nice. Beef neck. Cool. Let's do that. Sounds let's good. Do that. Let's do beef neck. And uh, we'd love you to leave something, if you can, for hopefully the uh, another guest. Have you got anything that you'd like to put on here for us? Yes. Now, I'm going to be nice. And um, one of my favourite things to cook is scallops. Nice. So let's put scallops on there. They're on. Great. Excellent. They're on there. So what are you thinking with beef neck? What's your what's your first first thoughts? Well, obviously we are gonna have to do it slow and low. Um initial things are tacos. Mm-hmm. Nice. We can make some nice fresh tacos out of there. We can make a warm. We could make a nice chili. I do like a chili. I might like to slow braise it Oof. and smoke it and make a nice little um chili out of it. I could slow cook it and make a lasagna there. Oh, slow. Oh, lasagna. I love a lasagna. I might slow cook my beef neck and pull it and make a beef lasagna. Oh, beef neck lasagna. Yeah, I love a lasagna. That sounds epic. Yeah. Now, ha- do you know when you have leftover pulled pork? Have you made a pulled pork lasagna? I have no. not. I've not. I've not considered doing that. I've done it with like brisket and things in the past, but I've never, yeah. never gone to the pork side. Oh, come to the dark side. Make a <laughs> pulled pork lasagna. You will thank me later. It is I've, delicious. I've made a lasagna where I've put black pudding as the first base. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm was, up with that. I love a bit it, of black pudding. I mean, it, it was very rich. But uh... <laughs> now, now, do you know? Do you know what I like with black pudding? Mash, black pudding mash. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, make it make, well, make, like mix, make mixed mixed in together. Tasty. Yes. Oh, okay, nice. Maybe a bit of black pudding mash, a little peppery in there, a little bit of nice richness in your, in your mash. Oh, that oh. sounds good. 
uh, and you can do your trio with pork with that. Mm. You, you pig's cheeks and you can make them down into a little sticky bonbon. Oh, stop it. It's a problem with this, isn't it? You just talk about food uh, all the time. It's yeah, like hungry all the time. Is, um, pork belly. So uh, you, you brine it in your cider and everything, all the flavours that you want to do that. Then you smoke it until it's nice and cooked. And then um, I squash it for 24 hours. So I press it in between two um, uh, baking sheets. Uh, so last one time I put 25 kgs on it and pressed it. And it comes out really, really thin and really dense. You can then can slice it and then you can grill it back up and you, you can get in that really crackly because it's been smoked for, for eight, nine hours. Um, oh. It's nice and fresh. You can slice it up and it's still melting your mouth. But so when you take it off and it's warm, you it, it falls to pieces because you've cooked it till it's so tender. But if you then squash it and refrigerate it, it then um, the consistency hardens back up so you can get it into nice slices and you can portion it out. And that with black pudding mass and sticky pig's cheeks bonbons. Oh, <laughs> It's, it, it's bloody I, lovely. I would never think to do that with with pork belly, but that yeah. sounds awesome. Again, it's a seems like a long process, but worth all the steps to get that end result. And so again, even with pork crackling, people say, "How do I get pork crackling?" And you say, "Well, do you know that supermarket pork that you buy on a on a Saturday? That's in the the shrink wrap that's really wet and horrible, and you take it out twenty minutes before you're going to cook it. You ain't getting crackling." <laughs> you need to take it out at least mm. two days to make sure that you salt it and try and dry your skin out and even better go to the sin butchers because as we already said the, the better the products are the, the easier it is to, to cook with go to the butchers who when they display it it's not shrink wrapped they'll then put it in a plastic bag and they'll give it to you when you take it home take it out of that plastic bag and put it back in the fridge with some salt on it to dry that skin out because if you haven't got dry skin, you're not going to get perfect crap. Mm. Yeah. We, oh. We're coming towards the end now, and I'm loving some of these tips that you've given us. Are there any other secret barbecue school hacks for getting the most out of cuts that maybe we haven't discussed yet that blow people's minds when you tell them? Now, yeah. There's so many that you... Off the cuff, you, you you don't think about it, and then you go, Do you know what? we could have done that. But one of the, the bigger ones, have you made oh, burnt belly pork eggs? We're going back to, I don't know why we've fixated on, on, on belly, but <laughs> the burnt belly pork eggs. Mm-hmm. Have you gone to your butcher and said, right, then I want some smoky bacon, uh, the, but don't slice it. I want the cured belly. And make your burnt belly pork ends out of cured smoky bacon. And you can cube them and you can make burnt belly pork ends out of smoked bacon, cured um, belly. Uh, They are just elevated to a different level. They are amazing. That's not. I've never tried that, but yeah, that sounds excellent. So I, I, I said one thing that we. You, know, you might go away and try, which is great. But yeah, the bacon, your bacon, burnt belly pork ends are absolutely fantastic. So um, Owen's been curing his own bacon from time to time. So what I'd like you to do, O, is uh, cure and smoke some bacon for me. And I'll do it with your bacon and see how that comes out. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. That's a challenge. Challenge expense. So, so I'm going to be making some beef neck. Mm-hmm. You're going to be making some um, smoked bacon so we can um, make, make some, some milk really. out of it. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Hoggy, as I said, obviously Dan said that we're kind of coming towards the end and just want to make sure, is there anything else that we haven't kind of covered yet that, uh, you know, you wanted to kind of get across in, in this episode? And, of course, plug yourself, tell us where people can find you afterwards, <laughs> of course. <laughs> ah, not massively. Uh, obviously, we're, we're Hoggy's Grill. We're barbecue school in Rutland. Um, nice and easy to get to in the centre of the country. Um, yeah, I, I run all the classes, so you get me. 
It's not a, a a place where you you rock up and you'll have any any chef coming in to do it. I'd run all the classes. Other than that, no, I would suggest to people, do you know, what, experiment because some of, some of the biggest mistakes. I mean, Guinness was a mistake. Somebody burnt the hops, turned it black, and Guinness, how big is Guinness now? So you might make a, a huge mistake and go, oh, that's absolutely fantastic. I'm I'm going to use that. So use good quality charcoal. Use your lid. Use a meat probe. All the all the same thing that everybody tells you to do, but don't be afraid. Have fun. Be confident, and do don't don't be scared of making a, a mess up because everybody messes. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's some really good tips. Thank you very much. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure coming having you on the show. Genuinely, lots of uh, mm. lots of uh, treasures there, but also some things that we're going to take away and 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 do ourselves. <laughs> I really want to go at squishing that pork belly as well. That between the sheets, yeah, that, that the sounds pork awesome. Belly and make burnt um pork um pulled pork lasagna. It is yeah. awesome. That'll be done. Top of the list. Thank you so much, Hoggy. Thank you. I literally did pulled pork yesterday as well. I have to go get some pulled pork. Have you, have you got Have you got any left left over? No, I put them into a mac and cheese. We had a bit of an American sort of style thing, but yeah. Okay. So, so what do you do? So I'm going to ask you, what do you do with your leftover lamb? So if you cook lamb, mm-hmm. and so you've tunnel burn a leg of lamb. You've packed it full of nice, nice flavors. You've cooked it medium rare. You, you're slicing it. You've got lamb left over. What do you do with your leftover lamb? Um, things that I've done with it, I like making almost like a cottage pie with it. Yes, uh, that's, that's really, really nice. Um, other things that I've actually passed through mashed potato before as well, yeah. and almost, almost had them in like a stew as dumplings as part of a stew. Yeah. Um, that's really nice. Um, sometimes I like to bring it back up to temperature in kind of stock and then just have it as kind of the main meat as part of a meal. Uh, what else have I done it done with it? Kind of in a pasta dish as well, more with its own kind of juices and tossed with tagliatelle, yeah. that sort of Cause, stuff. Because the, the lamb is the, the the one meat that you get that's called, you know, yeah. All right, let's wise it up and make a, a shepherd's pie. Mm. That's what I normally do with it. I was just wondering... What 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 could I be doing with leftover lamb rather than shepherd's pie? I'm but I'm liking ah, mm. uh, it up and making a set of rosties out of it. Mm. And saying, Do you know what we're going to have rost- lamb rosties? That might might work quite nicely. But it's just bouncing out. Mm. The thing is that you bounce ideas off people, and somebody will say, "Ah, have you tried it?" And that's what I love about the barbecue community. Everybody has done something and they've tried something that you got. Ah, I want to cook that next, and it's just the ever evolving landscape that everybody is so not happy to share. Well, most people are happy to share, and it's just a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic place to be. Yeah, and on the point of lamb, my favourite way to barbecue lamb is a butterfly leg. Yeah. I just think that's so, so good. It allows you to get more, without over-smoking it, more smoke across more of a surface area as well. I yeah. just find that comes out so nicely. For people listening and haven't tried that, go and try it. Yeah, so we have arguments when we come to lamb mm-hmm. at home. So Sarah likes fall off the bone, keep it on there. I want You want to pull the bone out, and it'd be nice and clean, fall about lamb. So Moroccan style. Yeah. yeah. Ernie and I like pink lamb. Yeah. And when we do lamb, I like to tunnel bone it. Mm-hmm. So you like to butterfly it uh, and get more surface area. I love to tunnel bone it so we don't butterfly it. We can mm. then pull the bone out and then stuff the lamb with a lot of flavor and then cook that um, as, a, as a joint. And then you can slice all the way through it without the bones. And I love lamb, but it's the leftover lamb that we struggle we've met if you had um crispy crispy um beef from i call it garboard beef from the chinese yeah um the crispy chili beef so we do that with the lamb so if we've got it up we slice it up and we make crispy chili lamb rather than the beef and it tastes less like cardboard 
So I don't like crispy chili beef. <laughs> I think that's just my problem. Um, <laughs> but my missus loves it. Uh, so we make crispy chili lamb, uh, which which is really nice. But it's, it, it's asking people what they, what they do and picking their brains and, and nicking their ideas and then passing them off as your own um, <laughs> two weeks later. <laughs> the, the, other, the other thing we do, which I haven't mentioned actually, is dice it up and then have it in an orzo, but almost cook it a bit like a paella, and at the oh, end yeah. finish nice. it off with yeah. feta as well. Oh, no, I love a bit. So good, that is. Very, very nice. Oh, and toasted pine nuts as well. So you've got like that's, a bit of different yes. crunches and stuff. That's really I good. I know, so cashew nuts. I love a bit of toasted cashew nuts to whack in there. Mm. This. Oh. I have no ideas for lamb because I just never cook it. I just I I'm out on this one. But lamb tacos would seem seem like a good way to use up leftovers. Yeah. <laughs> Bit shit. No, 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 lamb tacos. Lamb fajitas. Lamb fajitas. Yeah. yeah. It's just, just yeah. It's just. It's I don't just like lamb hoggy. Meat. I can't get on with it. Can you not? Not no, even a whole crusted rack of lamb. I can't. I've tried lamb so many times, different ways. I just can't get on with it. I don't know if we can be friends anymore. I, I, keep, I tell it's, him it's been emotional it's though. It's been emotional. Yeah. <laughs> Huge disappointment every single day. I have to speak to him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well cooked lamb is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I, love, I want to I love like lamb. it so much because it does like a yes. lot. It does obviously look really nice, and there's some fantastic recipes. Well, well to be to be fair, I told you I don't like brisket. Yeah, we, so so we're sharing. We are, we yeah. are sharing. And I think I think because we can we can share our dislikes, we can just concentrate on our likes and make them yeah. super likes and make them better. Yeah, like your bacon burnt belly pork ends. Mm. Yeah. I, I think you need to both go away and have a word with yourselves about how you're <laughs> acting, and then <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> uh hoggy thank you so much for coming on and i'm sure yeah, that we'll see you is. out in the wilderness at some point as well at different events and things like that and i look forward to it um so yeah thank you so much for coming on no yeah, worries thank you for having us that's it for another episode of the meet and greet barbecue podcast thanks so much to hoggy it was great to chat to him and talk to him about his clear passion for barbecue cooking outside and great quality produce um Hopefully you picked up some tips there. We certainly did. Um, and until next time, keep on grilling. Today's episode is brought to you by AOS Kitchens, the South's leading outdoor kitchen design and installation specialists.